Cliff and I thought, no, oh, they're recording in progress. Uh, Cliff and I thought it might be a good idea just to give a little bit of background on um, the initiative that that led up to uh, Jack's project and uh, just uh, just a very little bit of context. Um, Cliff did introduce me. My name is Melanie Dubois. I am a wildlife biologist for Ag Canada. I work in the um, science and technology branch, uh, previously with PFRA. So we're very used to uh, hands, uh, hands on, boots on the ground type of work. Uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, the Living Labs initiative. Um, this is uh, Ag Canada's, basically Ag Canada's approach to agri-environmental research. Uh, we're in actually the last year of this iteration of the program. Uh, and this is how, well, Cliff and I have worked together off and on for 20 years, something like that. <laughs> but this is our latest uh, partnership that um, he's been involved with. Because uh, the Living Labs, um, what we tried to do with this approach is form really solid partnerships with uh, watershed districts, with the Manitoba Association of Watershed Districts, with uh, Nature Conservancy Canada. Uh, I can't really name everyone. I'm, I'm sure I'm forgetting people. But the idea was to take a look at gaps in, in knowledge or information that producers actually had and then try and answer them. A lot of times at Canada Research and other researchers, we've really focused on, okay, what do we think are the questions? But this time we went to stakeholders and, and partners like Cliff and then to the producers to say, well, what are your real questions? Uh, and we figured that <laughs> if we asked what everyone else wanted us to look at, then we would um, come up with, uh, with some answers that would be adopted more quickly because they were actually responding to um, what was identified within the different communities. And so out of our consultation, um, people identified these themes of water, soil health, biodiversity, and climate. Now, there is a lot of uh, information online about this program. I'm giving you like the real Cliff notes. <laughs> Cliff notes, get it, Cliff? Um, you know, just to give you an idea of where we're coming from. Um, and really, uh, my area of focus has been the biodiversity and wildlife habitat capacity that was identified by about 80% of participants that they have a real interest in this. And uh, so this is, uh, this is where me and my team have played. And actually May Elsinger, who's on the line, she's part of this team as well. Um, so what we tried to do under the biodiversity uh, portion of Living Labs is really try and get a better understanding of status and trends of biodiversity on uh, the prairies and in the ag landscape. Uh, we have a unique opportunity in that the Living Labs isn't just in Manitoba, it's also in right now PEI, Ontario and Quebec. And they're soon to announce what's happening with the next phase where it will also be in Saskatchewan, Alberta, BC, and then a few more of the Atlantic provinces. So what we wanna do with that is not just take care of the priorities in each province, but use it um, to monitor those status and trends on biodiversity across Canada. Because really, um, we don't have a lot of good answers as to the impacts that uh, agriculture is having on biodiversity. And as a group, we decided that we were going to take a look at certain taxa across Canada. So we wanted to look at breeding birds because we know that uh, especially grassland birds, we've lost about 70% of them and they're really hurting. We want to look at beneficial insects, primarily bees and carabids. And when I say bees, I mean wild bees, not the honeybees. And carabids are um, ground nesting uh, beetles that eat um, pests of crops and also focus on weed seeds and things like that. In addition to those ones, in uh, Manitoba we're also looking at badgers and invasive swine. And really um, invasive swine, I don't know if folks have seen in the news, um, are becoming more and more of a problem in, in the prairies. Uh, so we're working a little bit with Dr. Ryan Brook out of Saskatchewan to look at that. But then uh, really we wanted to take a look at uh, badgers here as a real sort of keystone prairie species because they really are um, 
uh, confined to the prairies. And Jack's going to tell you all about that. So I'm not going to talk much more about them other than really, you know, badgers uh, can be seen as an agroecosystem health indicator. You know, um, a lot of their habitat has been converted to cropland. Um, pastures and field edges are really where they're living now. And a lot of times when you have uh, healthy badger populations and healthy badger environment, then you also um, have room for other grassland species as well as ecological goods and services uh, like pollinators, beneficial insects, as I was mentioning with the wild bees and with the crabids. Uh, you know, you get the benefits of erosion and nutrient uh, runoff control with that deep rooted vegetation that's so um, important to badgers. And uh, this carbon sequestration is becoming more and more of a, a common thing that, that we're looking at in agriculture. The next iteration of Living Labs really focuses on carbon sequestration and greenhouse gas mitigation. So that's going to be a big part. Uh, I'm, I'm going to go, I only have two more slides, so I'm wrapping up quick. Um, Jack's going to talk to you about uh, collecting the information, a lot about badger um, natural history. Uh, and, and now uh, Jack will mention he's, uh, he's graduated from his diploma program. And so we're going to take over some of the work that he was uh, doing. And we're going to run with that information. Really, we're hoping uh, it will help us understand the health of the remaining grasslands. It'll help us develop some of those BMPs, uh, beneficial management practices for producers and land managers. And we'll try and get an idea of uh, what type of disturbance badgers can tolerate and how much habitat is out there to sustain these uh, populations. And I'm just going to flash that up there so it'll be in the recording if you have any uh, interest in looking uh, up on the Living Labs. Um, the Manitoba Association of Watersheds is a, has got a fantastic website uh, that they can answer all of your questions. That's it. Now I'm going to turn it over to Jack. Thank you, Melanie. And I think it is good to get an understanding of uh, Eastern Prairies Living Labs in association with my project, just because it gives it a good framework. Um, so, again, hello, everyone. My name is Jack, of course, and I want to say thank you for coming out, spending the time to learn a bit more about badgers and get involved in the environmental community. Um, so, yes, my name is Jack, um, graduate of Assiniboi Community College, as well as I'm the Western representative for the Manitoba chapter of the um, Wildlife Society here in Canada. Um, and the big reason I'm here to, today is to talk about, of course, the North American badger. Um, very charismatic species, very interesting species, elusive species, and easily one of my favorite prairie species just because of I think they are fantastically cute if I'm going to be honest. Um, now in this pro in this presentation here I'm going to first talk about the badger in general stepping through its points of life and then get into the project I have done at Assiniboine Community College. So um, badgers are born around this time of year actually. Uh, March the late March to early April, born like many mammal pups, uh, blind and helpless to be ready to be cared by their mother. Um, litters usually come in from one to five with most commonly being three. Um, of course, that can change on the badger's environment. Um, badgers, if they can support more young, will have more young. Um, badger's physiology is fantastically suited to the prairies and their way of life. Um, they're stout animals, very long, and can vary in weight from about 6 to 14 kilograms from the smallest female to the largest male, with quite large front and back claws. These claws are fantastic for digging and are one of their main tools they use for hunting, which I will talk about a bit more later. Now, when um, badgers are young, they spend their uh, first about three months um, with the mother and um, are live off of mother's milk. They do go exploring around their dens once in a while, but most of the time will be with their mom. But actually not a lot is known about this stage in badger life, purely because they are quite uh, cryptic and 
hard to track. Um, keeping eyes on badgers usually involves um, some sort of tagging, which is quite difficult to do in the case of a badger. Now, the world of the badger is the world of the prairies. Um, they prefer large open spaces with uh, usually pasture land, and they can cover quite large home ranges. They go wherever there is food. Normally, they will try to be around ridges and ground squirrels. So um, they can be in an area as large as 80,000 acres in search for this area with food. But on top of land cover and land type, um, sorry, topography, they are quite important is the soil um, variation. So soil needs to be a Goldilocks comparison where it's not too much clay, sand, or silt. Soil with too much clay leads to it being too hard and heavy for it to dig in. Not enough, too much sand or silt leads to um, structural problems in where they're digging their dens and the den will fall apart on top of them. So badgers are really quite dependent on staying in these loamy soil areas, which makes the prairies quite well for them, especially Manitoba, because that is the majority of our soil type here in Manitoba. Now, badgers are fantastic hunters. As you can see here, this badger in the road has dug himself a pretty fresh den and has brought him home a, bad, um, a ground squirrel. Um, in their hunting techniques, they use their sense of smell as the main way to find their prey. So they will head near a ridges and ground squirrel colony, which normally once they get near, um, they'll, the ground squirrels will alert as they get close. Um, they'll use their sense of smell to tell where the gophers are underneath the ground and dig down on top of them. Now, this is normally done in the, at night. Uh, there is times where badgers hunt during the day, but they are most active at night. Um, and they actually will use tools in their effort to hunt. They will either use rocks or piles of dirt to cover up most exit, exits from the ground squirrel colony so that they are forced into one section for early, easy collection for the badger. Um, another trait of the badgers is that they will store food for the winter. So a badger's hunting techniques will change as it gets late in fall to be based around storage. So you can see here the hold uh, the, this badger has on the gopher is just squeezing the head and crushing the spine. It does this so it doesn't puncture any of the vital organs, so to slow the decay in the cold den, so they have a long form storage for food. Um, around late summer fall is when mating season begins for the badgers. Um, both the males and females will travel in search of a mate around this time, as by now the female is, females young has went off on their own. Um, they'll travel distances of up to 12 kilometers in a day in the search for a mate, which um, goes to show how habitat decreased for them is really challenging. They use these large um, prairie areas or historically have, and as, we, as they slowly, well, quite drastically went away, it's really had an effect on the badger population. Um, badgers also take part in delayed insemination. Um, this means that when the badgers mate, they don't, the females do not instantly become pregnant. There will be fertilization, but it will hold in delay until December, late February, so that the babies are then born in the spring. During the winter months, the badgers are still active. They will come out of their den. However, they are far less active, will cover far less distances and can e will even enter a state of torpor. So they slow down their heart rate and other bodily functions to conserve energy throughout the winter. And as well, as you can see here, the badgers will gain weight, get a little plumper for those winter months to keep warm and keep that sustained of food. Now, um, badgers movements, like I was saying, just to give some scale, this is a 10 kilometer um, wide circle around my town of Brandon. So from the center, a badger during mating period would easily cover this distance. So I just wanted to show you this so you get an idea of the space that was historically required for the badger. When 
we hear about conserving um, prairie habitat, the scale that we do, we need to understand it in comparison to the scale required by our native species. Um, and because badgers are so nomadic and cover such a large area, they actually have quite an effect on their environment. Um, they act as, as Melanie was alliterating to, an indicator of prairie health. If a badger is in the area, it normally means that a bad, there is a food source such as rich and ground squirrels. And if the rich and ground squirrels are there, there's a food source for them. So being near the trophic, um, near the top of the trophic levels, it is a quick um, way to get a general idea of the health of the prairie area. As well, they, because of their immense digging and how nomadic they are, they leave plenty of dens abandoned, which are used by many endangered species throughout Manitoba. Um, that includes species such as the swift fox, who don't have the ability to dig, and the burrowing owl, who also don't have the ability to dig. So without these badger burrows, these animals will be left without um, their natural space. And on top of that, the badger is also listed as special interest in the Canadian Species at Risk Act. Now, a lot of this comes from the lack of data on the Manitoba badger. A um, lot of the population data we use here in Canada is come from accidental catch via trapping and um, road kills, where um, just tracking the collection of road kill on the side of the road. So. That is where my project has come in. So um, my project was resolved, revolved around collecting citizen science data to get a better understanding of the badgers in Manitoba. Um, you can see on screen here is a QR code. If you were to use your phone to this QR code, it takes you to um, the badger survey, which is also available on the Manitoba Badger Spotters Facebook page. Um, this could be done to fill out some information, say, if you are a landowner about um, your land practices concerning the badger, or there's a shorter firm survey where you can simply send in the sighting. Um, as another part of my project, besides just collecting these sightings, I um, did some analyzing to get an idea of where these sightings were. So you can see here um, a map of Manitoba with um, Riding Mountain National Park being the large green space in the center there. And see if I can get Never mind. Um, and these were collected uh, via the survey that I which I spoke of and as well as iNaturalist, a website which also collects um, citizen scientist data of native species, far more than just the badger, but they are for public use. So I went ahead and used them for uh, my badger. Um, when looking at the data that I was able to collect for my project, um, I found that a lot of them was as to be expected with the majority of the sightings taking place on pasture land, followed by riparian area and uh, for cropland with um, plenty of pasture, as well as uh, taking place in loamy soils and in various um, flat areas. Um, with this understanding of where the badger prefers to go, uh, my project wanted to see where we could look for the badger more effectively to get an idea of where they are. So using Pemina Valley um, Central Watershed District as a pilot, I've created here a map which estimates the probability of finding a badger. So any of these spaces um, in green are preferable habitat for the badger. Um, the other areas aren't negatively imp impactful for the badger, they are just not positively impactful. So if we're to zoom in here, this red square is where one of my badger sightings was. Um, you can see this area, there's a large stretch of pasture land and loamy soil throughout the area with pockets of water and cropland um, adding those uh, blotches of unfavorable habitat and a um, canyon or mountain range going down the center. Um, this is would be an um, idea of an ideal area for the badgers. 
And just so you can get an idea of scale, you can see at the top where um, it says about where it shows three kilometers of distance. And remember that a badger can travel about 12 kilometers in a day in a mating season. So that is why it's still important to regard the larger map and to get an idea of the entire available habitat for the badger. Now, my other sighting that was in the my mapping area wasn't as dense into uh, suitable badger habitat with only uh, sparse areas of land. But this goes to show how um, badgers may be adapting to having less prairie habitat around and going in between these pockets of favorable habitat. Um, in the future, um, Eastern Prairies Living Labs will, as Melanie was saying, continue on with keeping up with the badger sightings that are sent in and hopefully be able to collect more and use the probability map to get an idea of where to say set up um, trail cams or search for badger um, identifying markers such as burrows um, so that we can get a better idea of how many badgers are in Manitoba so we can fill this data gap. Um, that is my presentation. I want to say thank you for taking the time again and thank you uh, for to thank you Cliff and the Pemina Valley Watershed District for allowing me to do um, my classwork as a pilot in the Pemina Valley Watershed District and Melanie for the Eastern Prairies Living Labs um, and help. Uh, for more information, a lot of my information has come from the 2012 COSWIC assignment status report, which you can find just on Google. Um, as well, if you would like to um, get in contact with me after the presentation, you can do that via email at badgerspotters at gmail.com or via Facebook at um, Badger, Manitoba Badger Spotters. We have a Facebook page, so please do not hesitate. Get in contact. I'd love to talk about badgers anytime. Yeah, thanks, Jack. That was excellent. Um, I, I'm sure there's uh, yeah, there's some clapping going on there on the on the screen. So um, I'm not sure if you're getting a standing ovation or not, but uh, <laughs> I guess uh, I'm sure there's uh, you know hundreds of questions people have. So uh, I know Melanie started us off. She had a question about uh, where did that little gopher come from, or that ground squirrel? Oh yeah, did the badger catch that gopher? In the side of the road. Uh, more than likely it would have been near that den there and it would have been actually created the den may possibly even for the purpose of eating the local uh, colony that's nearby. So what would often they do is they move around um, until they find a good area and uh, build a new a fresh den in whatever pocket of uh, reasonably loose dirt they could find. So more than likely, yeah, it was caught near that area and pulled over to his den. Okay, Brian has a question. Um, how often does the female need to hunt while nursing? Um, while nursing, they they hunt. Um, that's actually, I don't know, and I couldn't find any direct research. Um, like I was saying, the information on the badger's everyday activities is quite limited because of their nocturnal lifestyle and their nomadic lifestyle, it makes them quite hard to track and quite hard to um, understand. I missed it, but since the badgers are hard to spot in person, does the spotter um, survey accept signs of badgers um, such as uh, shapes of the holes? And yes, we do. Um, in the badger survey near the bottom, you can send in um, you can declare whether it's a direct sighting or a sighting of a badger burrow. Yeah, so thanks for the talk, Jack. Um, I was lucky enough, I saw your presentation, uh, your final capstone presentation at ACC. And uh, they had a they had booths set up and, and I know that your uh, booth was very popular, lots of people stopping by. What was the most common question that you got about badgers? Like, what are people really interested in, in knowing? Or conversely, what's what's the most common comment that or feedback people give you about badgers? 
Well, it may have just been my, um, the crowd I was exposed to during this project, but actually a lot of people I was running into were surprised that we knew so little about badgers in Manitoba. A lot of people are used to seeing badgers. They, um, especially farmers, they see them in their properties, they see their, their effects. And when they hear that they are listed as special interest or they hear that we have no idea how many there are in Manitoba, they're quite surprised that there's this lack of data. So I think that get, um, letting people know there's a lack of data and the badger being so charismatic and prevalent in farmers' lives that it gives them um, plenty of opportunity to let us know in the scientific community to get that data collected. You know, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll add that um, when, when you and I attended that uh, badger workshop, that is something that came up time and time again in the other provinces is, yeah, just the uh, lack of data. It's when you talk to most people and say, hey, you know, I'm looking for badgers. They're like, oh yeah, no, we see badgers everywhere. But sometimes then you ask, oh, okay, well, where did you see it and when? Oh, it's a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that it, it goes to show how um, charismatic they are in that when you do see a badger, it really sticks with you. And you're like, oh, yeah, I see badgers all the time. But when you really identify your sighting, you really just start to notice how infrequent it is. Um, I can see a hand up. My question uh, is, uh, do badgers mate for life or they're not? They're just the individuals like all through their life or? Uh, yeah, they're individuals okay. all through their life. The Except only time, maybe yeah, the only, correct. And okay. the only time they'll really ex spend um, extended periods together is the mother with their young. But once they split off, they are solitary for their life. Okay, thank you. But what are the chances of seeing a badger in the eastern part of Manitoba? So as you go more into the rockier areas and more wooded areas, you're less likely to see badgers as it doesn't um, fit in with their habitat requirements. So you're less likely as you get more into um, that boreal shield, but um, the open prairies and loamy soil areas, even on the east side of the province, you would um, in principle be able to see them. Um, yes, it is a factor considering clay soils. They really do like that, you know, not too, not too thick, not too loose, not too dry, not too wet kind of soil, the Goldilocks of soils. So um, thankfully in our prairie provinces and even um, the northern parts of uh, the states, we have that kind of soil condition that allows badgers to be so picky in their soil selection. I came from Eastern Manitoba and that's where I had most of my experience with badgers. Oh. I wasn't very far east of, I was between Dominion City and Baita. Uh, okay. Dominion City is in the River Valley, Baita is on the other side of the, the little escarpment that we have called the Ridgeville Ridge. So, and my farm was just above that, but we just, we used to have badgers in our hay fields. Oh yeah. But we also had rock piles, and I think that might have served as a location where they might want to probably hide during certain times of the day. I don't know if there's any predators of badgers because they're pretty fierce, but maybe there might be the odd predator. Um, in Manitoba, it's quite rare for anything to attack them. Maybe a wounded one would be attacked by a coyote, but um, it's not often that anything besides a human challenges a badger. And something that didn't come up in the presentation, but it's actually, um, badgers actually have the ability to dig backwards if need be. So in theory, if say a dog is barking them down, they could still be snarling and swiping their front claws while using their back claws to dig themselves a new burrow, which just goes to show how crazy and fight worthy wow. the badger is. That's pretty cool. My, my sighting was a long time ago, Cliff. It was like when I was like 10 years old. So I don't think it would be relevant today. Well, if you know folks in the area, still you should uh, ask them if they've seen them lately and if they would contribute. Another question I have is, do they hunt the pocket gopher? Yes, quite extensively. That's usually their main choice of prey. Not the Richard, so not Richardson's ground squirrel, but pocket gopher. Um, 
I wouldn't, I'm not varied enough in the, the differences between the two, but I know they will hunt most small mammals and any burrowing mammals that are around. They'll, okay. they'll travel and stay near. Um, and yes, Daniel? Hey, uh, I was just kind of curious. Uh, do we know what human activities are most detrimental to badgers? Um, it's mainly um, reduction of habitat. Um, with the wanting and needing these large areas, the more and more, say, um, pasture land is converted to cropland, or we slowly encroach more and more on the um, side bluffs or um, ditches of cropland, those are the areas which they're surviving on now. Okay. So as we take those away, it's more detrimental to the badger. And kind of the best thing they can have is um, a route they can take through cover that they can get from say pasture land to pasture land. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. If hunting is poor, do they eat carry on? Um, I'm unsure, but I believe they would. Um, and what I've seen is that badgers are pretty opportunistic um, and that they will take what they can get. But I'm not sure about um, how much they scavenge. I believe most of their food comes from, from the wrecked kill. Are you making oh. contact with any? And so I'm out, uh, you know, quite a bit on, uh, you know, outside the city for sure, within probably a couple of hours of Winnipeg in all directions. So I don't know that I've ever seen a badger in this general area, but, uh, but there again, I'm out during the day. So mm -hmm. it's less likely. I certainly have seen them in, in Western Manitoba, but uh, but I will keep, I do go down around Domain sometimes. So I'll keep my eye out around that area. Brian, yeah. that's where you said you were, Brian, you were in that area? No, I was east of the Red River. So I was about uh, 30 miles east of the Red, close to the US border. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Domain's a pretty heavy soil. Okay. Uh, yes, May? Hey, Jack, have you given this presentation maybe to like the Manitoba naturalists or the Westman naturalists or like other, the birder types, uh, you know, that really get around? Um, actually, no, but that is a good idea to be reaching out to those um, communities because, you know, people that are out in um, nature are more likely going to see the badger. And especially with summer coming, that's a very good idea. Thank you, May. I think that video you got of the badgers running along the road came from one of the Westman naturalists. Yeah, I believe so. I, I know um, Melanie supplied that for me. So that's that's good to hear. Yeah, Westman naturalists would be a good fit for you because it's that area. Um, John? I don't really interact with uh, raccoons. Like we have many more raccoons that, that in this area. Uh, but I haven't spotted any of the badgers that I can, can uh, remember. Um, I'm not sure on their interactions per se, but I do know that the badger, if I was to be a betting man on who would win in that fight, I'd bet the badger 10 times out of 10. So I think that um, more than likely raccoons would avoid them and probably wouldn't be in the same areas, purely because I don't, um, as far as I understand of the raccoon, they can't survive well in um, large open prairie the way the badger can. The badger is in the weasel family, correct? Correct. Are there any diseases that affect mink and some other animals that are in the same family that could affect the badger too? Um, not that I know of. A lot of my research and project hasn't been too inclusive in diseases. But I'd imagine if they're close enough uh, fami familiar links, they could be they would be affected by similar diseases. The habitats for some of them are completely different, but skunks and badgers would be in the same environment. Mm -hmm. mink, would, mink would be in a different environment, but those two, like skunks, carry rabies, and I'm just wondering if I I believe badgers are also able to carry rabies, like most mammals. So anything else? I'll get some yeah. in the chat for you, Jack. Oh. 
Um, what is the average range of solitary badger impacts climate change badger populations? So um, average range is usually about 2,000 acres. Um, they'll cover quite a large area moving throughout it. Um, they may stay in one section of their home range for a few weeks um, until the um, population is a bit more skittish of their prey um, and finding another one. And then um, for their impacts of climate change, um, one thing that's really going to be impactful is it's just keeping their habitat and um, droughts affecting the population of their prey species. So with um, um, droughts and or floods affecting the amount of small mammalians, uh, burrowing mammalians around Manitoba, it's going to have an impact on their ability to hunt. So with less prey, there will eventually be less badgers. With, but the only problem being, as of now, it is hard to gauge the impact that is happening on the species because we don't have a reference point for how many badgers there are. Um, yes, Linda? Have there been any studies done where they put tracking devices on badgers? Um, not that I was able to find in my research, okay. um, but that comes back to even just getting close to a badger is a problem. Um, but I, there may be a few down in the States. The only um, thing being some of them could be in uh, different habitatal conditions, such as more desert and arid areas where they're not covering the same type of uh, niches. And in the States, they'd be sort of in the grasslands type yeah. as well? Correct. So Jack, I think people could uh, follow the Manitoba Badger Spotters uh, Facebook and uh, is there going to be a written report or uh, I guess following that to, Me to Melanie about uh, future information and reports? And um, I believe through um, either the Wildlife Society or possibly Eastern Prairies Living Labs, um, more information about where the sightings are and characteristics of the sightings will be made available, yeah. Yeah, Mel, can you add to that? Uh... Yeah, yeah. So the plan is, so Jack has uh, kicked us off with the uh, Badger Spotter social media and the survey and uh, piloted the, the methodology for doing the mapping. And uh, yeah, so the plan is to take it from there, um, continue yeah. to take in surveys, update uh, the map as we're getting it, uh, yeah, as we're getting those surveys and um, hopefully keep people updated. And then eventually uh, this information will also hopefully go to um, environment, climate, uh, what are they, ECCC, Environment, Canada, mm -hmm. Climate Change. Sorry, folks. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, to help inform, because they're in the process of writing the management plan. But as Jack pointed out, they're really data deficient here in Manitoba. So they need that information and uh, we'll go from there. What about population increases? I guess if you have population, you have uh, less habitat. So they're like, they're not, uh, you know, focused on humanity. They're mostly out in the, the back 40. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they seem to be pretty compatible with um, forest edges, go back, tame pasture, Thing, things like that. So, I mean, they are subsisting in there, but um, as we know, there's more and more pressure on what we term uh, grass-based agribusiness, which is, um, you know, livestock production. Uh, it, it'll be interesting to see what happens with climate change as that changes our cropping systems in Manitoba and perhaps those pastures get pushed out a bit and, and converted and it's, it's just less habitat for badgers. But uh, really right now, the, the idea is to get a handle on where they are uh, in Manitoba so that we can try and guess to see what's gonna happen with them going forward. Um, we have another question. Yeah, a uh, question for Melanie. At the outset, you uh, had uh, a little, uh, are about uh, the bees, honeybees. Uh, recently, we've been told that uh, possibly half the honeybees in Manitoba were lost this winter. Do we know what caused that loss? 
Yeah, I was talking with Riel Lafreniere. He's the uh, provincial honeybee guy uh, with Man uh, province of Manitoba. And he was saying that the losses have been um, really uneven, that uh, some folks lost it all and some people lost none. So what they think is that it's going to it's going to come out to about 40 percent of the hives or, you know, population in in Manitoba. But they do think that it had to do with overwintering techniques and um, disease transmission, varroa mites and things like that. Uh, and again, that's just communicated to me from Rial. He is the expert on that. Um, my cool. area of expertise focuses more on on wild bees. Yeah and uh, they don't have the same disease pressure. So yeah, it's gonna cost uh, the honey producers more to try and raise more queens and uh, try and get their, their population levels back up and going. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, yes, John? Yeah, and one of the opening slides here, you got uh, the badgers group with uh, uh, invasive swine. Just wondering about uh, that that uh, comparison or, or category as far as is there antagonism between the two? I guess. Oh, the... <laughs> yeah. Maybe I should have separated those now that I think about them because one is a positive species and one is a very very negative species. Um, uh, I just point them out because we're unique in that the other living labs are not currently looking at badgers or invasive swine. Um, that's not to say that uh, that the Saskatchewan folks or the Alberta folks won't also be tracking invasive swine as uh, as a risk or an invasive species uh, and a risk to agriculture there. Um, they might add that we haven't seen what their focus is going to be yet, but uh, yeah, I should have had them separated out. That looks like the questions have slowed down a bit. Uh... Yeah, so I guess we could uh, we could sign off. Uh, you have contact information. We're gonna we're, we've recorded this session, so you can catch it later or pass it on. Uh, thank you very much to Melody and and Jack. Uh, you know, great job and and good luck in, in your future, Jack. It's been uh, it's been a real pleasure to get to know you, and uh, you know, it's been a, it's really kind of a cool project. Thank you. Thank you, Cleft, and thanks for the opportunity to speak on my project. It's a great opportunity. Okay, thanks, with Jack. that. Good presentation, and thanks, Cliff, for the uh, Pembina Valley Watershed for sponsoring this. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Cliff. Uh, your support meant a lot to Jack. Um, we'll point out that uh, that Cliff and his crew uh, commissioned um, Manitoba Badger Spotter calendars and magnets to have the contact information. So stop by, see Cliff, see what's going on with the watershed district, and pick one up. Thank you very much, Cliff. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Okay, good night, everybody. Good evening. Good night.